This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, 16 Candles is celebrating 35 years, and that's my favorite John Hughes movie. And I have a return guest on the phone. In fact, one of the big reasons I brought her on here was not so much for the anniversary. as that she's just so much fun to talk to. And uh, I have the wonderfully talented and absolutely cool and awesome Leanne Curtis on the phone. How do you do, Leanne? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing, Greg? <laughs> You know, it's it's great to have you on. It's like I had so much fun having you on before, and you know, uh, you have no filter, and that doesn't bother me at all. I like people that are real, and you can't get too much more real than you. Ow, 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 damn it. Yeah? Ah, uh, I just pinched myself just to make sure I was real and I'm strong. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am real. I'm super real, except for the fact that all of this is an illusion. So, like, I don't know where that leaves us, but that's okay. <laughs> now I'm confused, and we're not even two minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I have you on Facebook, and anytime you have a live video on, you know, I, and I catch you, I love watching your live videos, especially, like, when you're wandering around, you're just talking to the camera. And <laughs> Yeah, and then I start talking to inanimate objects that look very strange. <laughs> yeah, I think my last video was, uh, first of all, it wasn't live because I couldn't get a bloody Wi-Fi signal in the middle of Manhattan. How do you not get a Wi-Fi signal? Like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> anyway, so I had to flip on to, like, normal video, as was suggested by the guy who helped me <laughs> drag groceries home from Trader Joe's. But, like... <laughs> Then, then I don't know because it was in selfie mode. I had to give him the camera, and it just it just got awkward. I don't know, but I still made my movie. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Uh, I think that cover fit picture or picture or whatever you have on Facebook, where your your poor mom is sitting there in bed trying to eat, and you got your like your tongue Remember stuck out. Lick her ear, yeah, and the look <laughs> on her face. That pretty much sums up our relationship. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. You, you, and your mom have a wonderful relationship. I take it. No, she, we don't. No, <laughs> no, we don't. It's like postcards from the edge without the cocaine. <laughs> oh, I love that expression on her face. <laughs> yeah, so do I. Which is why I just keep poking at her. It's <laughs> a way to keep her engaged. Like it's you know, other people play Scrabble and Bingo. I do that. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what. When I'm, if I'm ever laid up, I, I'm, I'm gonna have you come. <laughs> really? And then what? <laughs> it's like you got a fifty-fifty chance of just being like sh shocked to death, <laughs> or wanting to get out of there so badly that you heal fifteen times faster. I don't know. Either way, <laughs> it's a result. There you go. <laughs> well, how are you doing? I think I'm okay. I've been here in New York for a minute now. I, I, I'm, I'm in my ninth week straight of being away from home, taking care of my mom. She's got Parkinson's. She's a jazz composer. So, like, my life completely turned upside down, which is really cool because it's given me the opportunity to, uh, to think and be silent. And it's really, you know, when you find yourself stuck, not stuck, I guess, but let's see. When you choose to put yourself into a situation which is, completely different from what you've been used to for 30 years. Um, it kind of, I don't know, I, I don't want to say throws you off balance, that's the wrong way, but it, it definitely shakes things up. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it was an opportunity to kind of look inside and, and I've been yammering at my friends like for the last year because you know, people live so stressfully, and, like, I've been very stressed out, and I've had issues with anxiety and all that stuff. The doctor's like, oh, you need to take Lexapro. You've got an anxiety disorder. I was like, yeah, you've got to take your copay and take your drugs and shove them up your ass now. I'm not doing that. Like, I would rather go meditate. Go fuck yourself. So I kind of, um, my first step was to just say, okay, well, I guess I'm just going to say that I'm accountable for 100% of everything that's happening to me. Like the people in my life, everything, everything, everything. So I kind of did that. And then I started talking about energies and frequencies because I had a feeling like it's just about vibration. And 
you know, just sort of remembering stuff that I had been reading when I was 19 before I had the whole 30 years of children. Um, but more and more, I just started talking. My daughter said, you're starting to sound like a hippie mom. <laughs> like, yeah, well, I don't know. It's, 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 it's more and more... More and more, I'm convinced that everything is like epigenetics, for for lack of a better, more more civilized uh, um, civilian term. Like I don't I don't even know what epigenetics means. All I know is that we use n- like three percent of our brains, and the other ninety seven percent nobody knows anything about. And my mom, who has Parkinson's, and you know it's the brain. It doesn't give dopamine, but like there's a gut brain connection, and nobody talks about what the doctors can't see and like doctors treat bodies like body parts like it's a bicycle with a chain and a this but like what makes you breathe what makes your heart beat what makes you able to think like it's something it's not a body part it's something you can't see so we're back to energy frequency like and i'll go as far as saying quantum field yep i'm i'm i've i've like i've gotten really super trippy (laughs) <laughs> and I want to make a show called Writing the Frequency, F-R-E-A-K-W-E-N-C-Y. So I've been busy developing that. And so that was my very long way of introducing the fact that um, I'm, I'm about the business of, of energies, frequencies, manifesting, and just sort of being in alignment with the thing that created us all. Like, and everybody has a different name for it. But it's not organized religion. It's science, based in science. How's that? Okay. Uh, that's how Leanne is. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm not going to be kooky. Because that's fun. We're here to have fun, Greg. We're well, here to have fun. We're not here to, like, stress out and be all fucked up and suffer. We're just not. No. We are. We're all a bunch of divine beings, and we create our reality, whether we do it consciously or unconsciously. So I decided to try to do it consciously. Mm. My mom has Parkinson's as well. and It's hard. Yep. It's hard. How old is your mom? She's in her early 70s. My dad has ALS, so that's... Oh, my goodness, you're surrounded. And are you an only child? No, i got two brothers. Uh, um, Sometimes that doesn't help. <laughs> well, my older brother's not around, but my uh, younger brother is pretty much taking care of my folks. So uh, Okay, so the, the weight is on him right now? Yeah, because I'm kind of working, and uh, eventually I, I'm hoping to get an opportunity to... Um, build a place with my younger brother and his wife where they live upstairs and I live downstairs but uh, hopefully that'll come together this year where uh, we'll sell the house I grew up in and whatnot but wow sounds like there's like a lot of um what's the word I'm gonna look for um sounds like there's a lot of contrast going on yeah like like yeah, and it's hard because there's a lot of emotions around all that stuff. Yeah. Well, I want to move closer into town anyway, you know, because it's mm-hmm. where everything is. Yeah. I know since I last spoke to you, I I, um, I was invited by a Canadian actress to assist her in Toronto at a, a horror film event. And it oh, was the first nice. time I'd ever traveled. <laughs> wow. What an adventure. Did you have fun or was it scary? Like, I'm oh. really curious, like, what was the vibration in you? Like, what, were you terrified or was it, like, a big adventure and you had fun? Well, when I started to go, I was nervous about it. But once I got into Toronto, I didn't want to leave, you know. Wow. <laughs> um, See, it's like a little kid who didn't want to get in the bathtub and I can't get him out. Yeah, I I had so much fun and I've been to Toronto twice since. And um, actress Lisa Lang was my uh, now gone from me being her fan to her being my friend, and I'm still in touch with her. And uh, I plan to go back to Horrorama again this fall um, to take part in that event. So that's always fun, and uh, I love the the connections I get with the people I interview, you know, and and they trust me, which is a big thing, you know, because with the uh, Media, you a lot of people, there's a trust issue, and I can see why, because they dig dirt. Yeah, I guess, but, like, I'll go back to, you know, what's <laughs> intention and, and vibe, man. It's like you don't vibe as one of those, one of those. No. <laughs> right, no, we don't, we don't feel like you're like that. <laughs> nope. You know, you've got a good intention. Mm-hmm. So it's just, I think that's, that's so important, you know, mm-hmm. so important. Because it actually, 
you know, it, 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 here we go. It changes the frequency. Like, you know, you want to vibe at places that make you feel satisfied. If you're not feeling satisfied, you're not in alignment. And if you're not in alignment, it's time to check yourself. It's really simple, you know, even though people just kind of go, oh, what? But, yeah, that sounds like there's a lot of emotional stuff that's, that's around all this stuff. I sure, I wish you, I wish you clarity and I wish you an easy manifest of all of it. And I hopefully your brother and I guess his wife and everybody mm-hmm. will all come together and, and, you know, make things happen for the greater good of the greater amount of people there. Mm-hmm. Do you do the convention scene much anymore? Or? You're so funny. Funny that you should ask. I, I found it that my, my dear, dear, dear friend, Jim Dotton, I've been trying to get him to do conventions for like a decade almost. Yeah. And he's like, oh, Lee, I don't know. I don't know, Lee, I don't know. And then, like, out of nowhere, I'm seeing James Dalton's going to be a chiller. And I'm like, wait, what the f- What? <laughs> so, like, and now, like, he posts several times a day. He's like a very cogent poster. Like, mm-hmm. he's got his posting shit together. Just, like, the posts that he puts up. The obscure photos, like, and I don't know if he's making copies of all the photos that he's putting up on Facebook to sell at Chiller, but the dude should go home with, like, 20 fucking grand. Like, <laughs> I mean, I know it's not all about money and stuff, but yes, it is. But no, it's not. Yes, it is. Um, no, it's not. It's, <laughs> um, but it, sometimes it is. Um, but, like, I, I, I'm just thrilled that he's doing it. So I, I started posting on Facebook, like, dude, are you going to, you're going to be there? Like, and what are your dates? So he told me like when he's getting in and I thought, well, if I can find a babysitter for mom, maybe I'll just go out and hang out with him. Well, my other friend, Matt Beckoff, mm-hmm. who's an agent, but he's turned into a friend. Um, he actually works with Larry Storch and he let me borrow the wheelchair because Larry's not using it right now. And I needed to get my mom someplace tomorrow night. Um, so bless his heart. Larry, Larry's <laughs> corporal Agarn. Uh, let me let me borrow his wheelchair for my mom. Uh, so Matt, out of nowhere, I've been trying to manifest. Like I've got my abundance board up, and I'm I'm just trying to meditate, and I'm just trying to like you know create amazing things out of the nothingness, you know. And it seems to be working because like every day I ask for a sign, and yesterday my sign was I checked my Facebook Messenger, and sure enough, I've got an invitation to go to Chiller. So like now I'm trying to figure out like. And I'm sure it'll happen very easily. Like, I, I just got to get my box of photos and my little banner here from L.A., which is probably just a walk down the street to the UPS store for my husband. So mm-hmm. that should be good. Like, and maybe I'll make a little money. I probably won't make as much money as Jim Dotton, but, like, it, it's still revenue stream. So, you know, little things, little olive branches keep coming in. But, like, dude, I'm going to make a fuck ton of money, and I'm going to help my mom. I'm going to have a fully staffed house. I'm going to I'm gonna be in the 1%. I'm doing it like I just uh, I will make the public announcement that I'm getting ready to get ready to get ready to get ready so that when it comes, I am so ready and so happy and so in it. And so I can help people because if I have lots of money, then maybe I can help other people like I want to help. I like helping. Yeah, I don't have anything to help with. (laughs) Well, you know what? I um, I think it'd be great even if we eventually get you down here, you know. I, I, I think you would be a draw, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I've got a mommy sitter. It'll yeah. Great. Yep. Are you involved? Right now I've got to figure out what's going on at home. My husband, like, <laughs> the landlord sold or, or the owner sold our house in mm-hmm. L.A., so my husband has to move. I'm here. He's got most of my birds. I've got one of them here. I've got my mom. So it's kind of like most people would look at my situation and go, oh, my God, what are you going to do? I look at my situation and I go, oh, my God, this is so cool. <laughs> like, what an opportunity. And everybody's looking at me like I'm fucking nuts. It's like, <laughs> no, the breakdown. It's the breakdown before the amazing shit. Like, all the, you can't have new experiences and walk around being the same person who was having all the old experiences. Mm-hmm. You can't do it. Can't do it. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, well, Joe Dispenza. Go go check out that dude. Joe Dispenza, D-I-S-P-E-N-Z-A. I'm going to interview that motherfucker. <laughs> I want him on riding the frequency. I want them all on riding the frequency. I want Abraham Hicks. I want all of them. I want them all to come talk to me, all of them. But, you know, breaking the habit of being yourself. There's, 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 <laughs> it's in the title of the book. Like, and here I am doing promo for some dude, and he doesn't even know it. Hey, Joe. <laughs> 
Hey, Joe, buddy. What? <laughs> You're going to be big in Canada. There you go. <laughs> Probably already is. Well, I think uh, you'd be a draw at Chiller. I think so, yes. <laughs> well, maybe if they had a little more advanced warning than two weeks, oh, guess what? Leanne's going to show up. But I kind of do that. You know, I kind of, I'm like the magic Jeep. I kind of pop in when I'm needed and then I leave. <laughs> What's the most interesting thing you've ever been asked to sign? Well, I think that goes back to me, myself, and I. I want to autograph my left breast, and then I want to get it tattooed in there. And then my daughter, here, here's, here's the difference. My 19-year-old daughter just looked at me, and she was like, Mom? I said, yeah. She's like, that has got to be like the stupidest fucking thing <laughs> I've ever heard in my life. Don't do that. Just don't. <laughs> and then here on the other side... <laughs> I've got Slim Jim Phantom from Stray Cats, and like it was just some off comment that I made walking back from the convention, Spooky Empire, to the hotel. Mm-hmm. Actually, we were probably going to go to the Wawa and go get something. Like, who names the store the Wawa? But that's a whole <laughs> other conversation. Never mind. Um, so I'm like, I look up at Jim because you know rock and roll guys get asked to sign, to sign my boob. I'm like, you know, maybe one day I'll go to a Stray Cats concert and. I'll walk right up to you and, and tell you to hold my camera, and you'll say why, and I'll say, because I want to sign my own boob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he thought it was brilliant. My daughter thought it was lame, but there you go. <laughs> Hopefully when she's in her 50s, she won't come to me when I'm in my like 80s and go, hey, Mom, I had the best idea. What's that? And, yeah, I'm going to sign my own breath. That was my idea. Blech. Right. You, you you think she's uh, going to uh, care for you the way you care for your mom? You, you God, are, I hope not. Is she going to drive you up the wall? <laughs> I hope not. I'm a bully. Like my mom is like the most depressed narcissistic person. I love her to death, but her energy sucks, man. She's she's like scared. She's depressed. She's she just you know uh, like her whole life she's been like that. And now that she's old and can't like she the Parkinson's and all this stuff, she's mm-hmm. just become like a a, a, a a literally a shaking bowl of jello. Like it's bad, and she's just not nice sometimes and you know it's okay like i i don't blame her but i just i'm trying to take accountability for my own shit and it's just hard when you see the person who created you not capable of doing that right now and it's okay like all this parkinson's and the dementia and stuff it's mm-hmm. happening to her it's not happening to me and i just have to be taking deep breaths every day and try to be patient and compassionate it's just really hard like when People keep saying, I'm just so dizzy. It's like, you got to drink more water. She's like, I do drink water. No, you don't. She'll guzzle chocolate milk, three glasses, and then I'll put like a glass of eight ounces of water, and she'll take two sips and go, oh, I can't drink it. I'm like, but you're... Okay. <laughs> then I'll look at her and tell her things like, are your body is made 70% of water. If you don't drink water, you're going to get dizzy. This is just, oh, you're not a doctor. I'm like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> okay. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> and I still haven't played one on TV. But I swear to God, Mom, you got to fucking drink the water. This is why you're... It's like, it's just common sense. Oh, my God. I need a buddy for my mom because I want to come up there and... and, and <laughs> I want to come up there and play with Greg. And I want to go yeah. play riding the frequency with, with everybody else. Like, it's okay. <laughs> the fuck ton of money's coming so I can go play. There because you go. That's why we're here to play and have fun and learn and expand. So there you go. Kooky Leanne has turned into hippie Kooky Leanne. Are you involved with any charities of any kind? Mm, pet rescues here and there. Pet okay. rescues, animals bring me so much joy mm-hmm. that that um, I I like one day there's a house in L.A. and I swear it's my house. Like I don't know why I keep thinking it's my house, but it is. It's not really. It's for sale for a minute, and the price keeps dropping. <laughs> like I've never owned a house before, but who cares? Why not? Like I'm just casually in my head going, "Yep, that's my house." <laughs> One day I'll walk in the front door and, you know, it'll be my house. But, like, after the fires in Los Angeles, there are a lot of birds. Yeah. There are two, there are, there are two sets of macaws um, that my friend Omar has been um, housing, I guess, or boarding at his store at Santa Monica. And mm-hmm. one of them's name is Bonnie, and Bonnie only has one wing. Oh. Bonnie hates everybody. But when I went into the store, I got her to talk to me, and I got her to, like, take stuff from my hand without trying to kill me. You know, she went after me a couple of times, but, you know, thank God the cage was between the two of us, and I know how to I know how to maneuver so that my car doesn't take my face off. Um, they can't do that, at least not when Nicholas Cage is right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, Nick, I need your face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll give it back in a couple of weeks. Yeah, no, 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 no. As soon as I'm done with Larry's wheelchair, I'll give you your face back. Wait, what? 
<laughs> no. Anyway, um, so yeah, so Bonnie and Bailey, I think, um, lost their home, home burnt in the fires and stuff. Like, there's a 20 car garage in this house that I want. Like, I would make half that uh, bird rescue place and have it staffed, like, so that there's a place for unwanted birds to go. Then I'd probably make a fucking grow house out of the other part and just leave my two or three cars. Because who needs more than two or three cars when you only have two or three people in the house? I don't need 15 million cars. No. If I want to go play in some special car, I can go rent it for the day and then bring it back to its owner and not have the headache. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so like in my mind, if I had a big giant house like that, part of it would be donated and dedicated to to animals. I'm trying to give them a place and a space to exist and not be afraid. Yeah, the fires were pretty bad there. I saw some mm-hmm. footage of that. Yeah, they were pretty screwed up. Yeah, and then and then the response to the fires was not was not the most uh, compassionate. No, shall I say? Um, so whatever it's, it is what it is. And hopefully here we go. Like hopefully the consciousness, uh, the mass consciousness sort of shifts and continues to shift, you know, and people start waking up a little bit more and stop, stop behaving in a manner that just propagates people being all stressed out. Like if everybody were not stressed out, I think that the behavior generally would change. So your mom's uh, into jazz music, huh? Yeah, yeah, she's a jazz composer. Yes, sir. She's uh, she's quite something. She's like jazz musicians should be here every day, hanging out, trying to steal her copyrights. It's, anything she writes turns into a standard, pretty much. It's it's uh, as as weird as she is, and as as um, as not necessarily complimentary as what I said before was. Uh, she's incredibly talented, you mm-hmm. know, and and. Her connection with Source is definitely and has definitely been through her art and her music, and that's the one place she does understand being connected to a higher, a higher energy, you know, because because creatives, man, I, I think that we definitely have um, a lucky a lucky streak when it comes to that. Do you have any of that talent? I write music. Yeah, I okay. write music. I've got a bunch of projects that are. That are that are I'm mulling I guess mulling they're they're developing and they're they're simmering in the back of my head like my mom's had some very interesting times like I'm I'm doing a documentary on my mom slowly um, I probably shouldn't do it too slowly because I don't know how much time she's got left but you know what I just sort of have resigned myself to it takes the time it takes the, I'll pay attention to it when I'm supposed to um, a lovely young girl named Natalia Ferrara um, who went to high school with my daughter Jack at the Los Angeles uh, County High School for the Arts. Um, is now here at NYU in the film program. Mm -hmm. Um, So I approached her because I just kind of thought, you know, maybe I'll call Natalia. It was like a casual, you know, thought um, that I received. So I I followed through on that. And she said, it's funny that you call right now. I'm right in the middle of a documentary class. Like, and I'm just, I've got projects right now, but like this sounds pretty fascinating. And what are you doing this summer? Are you going to be around? I said, sure. I said, Why? And I'm thinking maybe, or we're both thinking that maybe this summer what she can do is come work for me and my production company on the documentary, and she can get credit for it, and I can have somebody who knows what the fuck she's doing, because I sure don't. Is there go, um, I is mean, there, I do and I don't. Is there going to be footage of you annoying your mom? Oh, there'll be some of that, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. There'll be, there'll be <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I get tickled by that when you put that. I'm sure she does too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't tickle her too much because she, she's her, she'll forward her bladder if I do. So it's I can't tickle her anymore. Bad. <laughs> Old age has taken away one of my wake up toys. Tickle. <laughs> Gary Busey used to say, "Hey, Jackie, come here, come sit on my lap," and she'd be like, "Okay, why?" He's like, "Well, we're gonna play. Identify the smell. We're gonna scratch and smell." She'd go, "No, I don't want to do that." And he'd say, "Okay, well then, let's come play tickle and pee. Come on, sit on my lap." And he would grab her and start tickling her, and she'd laugh. He's like, "Have you peed yet?" I'm like, yeah. Hey, Gary, come play tickle and pee with Paulette. It'll take really. It won't take long. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Gary, Gary Busey. There you go. It's my challenge to Gary Busey. Next time you're in Manhattan, you're going to play Tickle and Pee with Paulette. How's that? <laughs> Maybe she'll write a jazz song. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Yeah, you're going to have to tag him in this interview now. Oh, so, Gary. <laughs> Is he on you know, Facebook? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know if he's on Facebook. He's definitely on um, 
I don't know what's on Facebook anymore. You know, I got really pissed off at uh, um, two people named Warren and Stephanie Delange, okay? Mm -hmm. Eddie Delange is a songwriter. He wrote a song called If I'm Lucky. Well, my mom's big song is If I'm Lucky, parenthesis, I'll be the one. And it was mishandled. Mm -hmm. It was mishandled. And, you know, the way I'm looking at the contract and how everything happened in 1982, my mom's partner and she... um, took the renewal back at the United States Copyright Office and did nothing. And the way the 1947 revised Copyright Act, blah, 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 and the standard contract, I don't know, whatever. I'm still not good at at all this lawyer talk stuff. Mm -hmm. But all I know is that the contract says that if she does nothing, she owns it, and they have to cough it back up. Well, this company, who shall remain nameless, decided that when they bought a catalog that my mom's song should have been removed from, they didn't remove it. So they've been acting and pimping out my mom's song since 1985 and behaving as if they have legal control of it, which they don't. Um, the worst case scenario, if I lose, then I will co-own it with these guys because I do control U.S. and Canada, and they'll be my business partners. But if I can get them to give me the thing back, that'll be good because then there are a bunch of other songs that are the same deal, like these publishers. It was a one-term non-renewable, and we took it back. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to get her music back so that I can end up, you know, getting it placed on TV and film if I can and start getting some revenue in from her from her classic standard songs. Some things I have here um, are transfers of demos that she cut, because back in the day, songwriters would cut demos, and they'd be good to play about 50 or 60 times, and then they would just sort of like, you know, skip, <laughs> crack, whatever the hell it is. So I have a couple demos of my mom singing songs. And three of them were accepted by a company called Crucial Music, and they've been actively pitching them. So I'm just sort of waiting to see what happens. Um, and it's non-exclusive, so I may go after a couple other places. And I've got my daughter Jacqueline said, sure, go ahead to some of the songs she's not going to sing live or whatever. So I've gotten a couple of her songs placed. So maybe we'll start making a little revenue that way. That's awesome. Um, right. I'd like to, my mom, look. You know what, 95 penniless on a fixed income, like, and she's got a song that John Coltrane and Carmen McRae and Bill Evans and Charlie Rouse and, like, I could go down the list of everybody who's recorded it and she's not making any money. The song has not been saturated, like, the, the industry hasn't been saturated with the song. You haven't heard it in all of the, you know, uh, soundtracks yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I can control this song for a good long time, and I will and I'll make it make some money. My hope is that I can get it to do that while she's still alive so that she can see the fruit of her intellectual property and her creative labors do something for her. Like, she'd like a walk-in tub. I would love to give her a walk-in tub. Who has (laughs) $16,000? The industry has $16,000 to license one of her songs. That's cheap. That's cheap. Yep. By, By industry standards. Yep, I agree. So, you know, I could have walk-in tubs. I could probably buy this apartment if I wanted to, if if the price is right, if I play the game right. Like, so I'm, I'm learning, and I'm being very diligent about cleaning up her mess and making making all of the creative content that's just sort of laying around on shelves. All the babies need to come make some money for us. Yep, I you agree. Know, the children need to go out and work for Mama now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it sounds really bad, but... Really, it's not. <laughs> not in this case <laughs> or this context. Mm. Well, 16 Candles is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year. Wow. Like, <laughs> I like that 35th anniversary for them, and I'm 53. So there you go. I like that in I, numbers. I thought you were 35. <laughs> well, I act like I'm 13. <laughs> <laughs> Much to the disgust and dismay of my mother and my husband. <laughs> I love sixteen candles, and uh, you half half asleep passing that note back, and uh, well, Michael Shuffling sticks his foot out and gets it, so Molly doesn't get to read the sweet nothings. That's right. Yeah, are you still in any touch with uh, Molly Ringwald? Nope. No. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very superficially in touch with her here and there, like you know, if if. If we cross paths, like I remember one time I went to go see her play at, um, oh God, where was it? It was a hotel. She was singing her jazz stuff 
and um, she was there with her husband, Tanyo, I think is his name. Mm -hmm. I, I can never... I always remember his name because it's like piano, but it's it's like if you were if you were. Um, <laughs> why does the word schizophrenic keep coming in my head? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no, that's not the word. Schizophrenic is not the word. <laughs> no, it's when you invert your letters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, there you go. So piano, panio, whatever. <laughs> anyway, so she was she was nice. She was kind of reserved and a little guarded. Um, but she's always kind of been like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure what that is. Like that, it just doesn't feel friendly. It feels like, I don't know. It just doesn't feel nice. I don't know. That's, that's all. It's like, I can't put words to it. Look, either, either you, this is why I say energy. Have you ever walked into a room or have you ever been next to somebody who's just like really pissed off and you can just like feel it bristling off of them? Yeah. Okay, that's what I mean. Like, people have vibrations. People, people, like, and what vibration you carry is what you get mirrored back at you. It's, mm. you know, so when I hang out with Molly, it doesn't feel warm and nice. <laughs> it feels cold and prickly. I mean, she kind of just looked, looked up at me and kind of cocked her head to the side. And she said, are you Leanne? Leanne Curtis from 16 Candles? Like, how disconnected? I don't know. It was just disconnected. Yeah. Disconnection. There's some kind of disconnection. I'm not sure what that is, and it's like I feel, it feels like there's a lack of trust in something, and I don't know, but that's her monkey in her circus mind. Not my monkey, not my circus. <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, it's the same year I interviewed you later on that year, I had John Capolos on. And I love John. John's I awesome. I love him. He's a good guy. He's open. He's warm. He's happy. He's, he's, the, see, this is what I'm saying. Frisky, happy, open, like this reserved, guarded thing. Like, what is that? Mm -hmm. There's some kind of pinch, pinching off of, of, of source flow. Like, I don't know. Like, open, happy, nice, frisky. Like, that, that's what seems normal to me. But that's maybe just who I am. I don't know. Well, it's funny because I got a lot of uh, compliments about his interview. In fact, another podcaster reached out to me and and wanted to interview him. So I reached out to John Capolas and asked him if it, uh, if he I had his permission to give his contact information to this podcaster, and he said yes. And it's funny because uh, the this has never happened to me before. But the podcaster sent me a message thanking me. Of course. It, yeah, he thanked but me because he. People are supposed to help each other. People are supposed to be loving. People are supposed mm. to be, like, I, this fear-based, like, survival mode. Like, all I can say, it's like, I'm just parroting words from Joe Dispenza, but, like, they're so accurate. It's, it's, I can't help it. Yeah. You know? Well, he had a good interview with... Uh, saying, really. Yeah, he had a good interview with John, and um, and John Keppel is, yes, he's a he's a, a wonderful guy. It, uh, very open, very friendly, Yeah. But uh, and uh, Havilah Morris, I like too. I didn't have her on. She's a but... very sweet girl. She's she's awesome. She's also very 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 kind. Her daughter Faith Score, very talented ballet dancer. Yeah, and of course we all remember her little haircut scene in the sixteen. Little haircut. <laughs> yeah. Her haircut in the little door. Haircut. That's such a dude thing to say. Her little haircut. Yeah, no, her hack job. I gotta her say. Hack job. One of my favorite things. <laughs> One of my so favorite. Jamie, I was such an asshole. They <laughs> wanted us to share our dressing room, and I was just so shell shocked because um, I don't know. I just I I I had been maybe misbehaving a little bit, and maybe people sort of found out, and and like I don't know. So I just kind of wanted my privacy. <laughs> um, so when it was put to me that Jamie had no dressing room and would I be willing to share mine with hers, I pretty much told him to go fuck himself. <laughs> that was not nice. Sorry, Jamie. Jamie Gertz. Mean to you. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, you know, I mean, do I lose sleep over it? No. But when we talk about it and like these little thoughts flit back into my head about who I once was, like it just, you know, I've always been fun and frisky. I just haven't always done things with with good intention it was very grabby and not sherry and just you know only childish so sorry jamie hmm yep yeah, but um 
One of the things I loved about Haviland more is I love the fact that rather than play the the mean counter to uh, to Molly Ringwald, I like the fact that we're allowed to like her, and that yeah. was one of the geniuses of John Hughes, I think. Yeah, and like, who knows if it's advertent? Sometimes things like that just happen, mm-hmm. you know. Well, in another movie, they would have had her be the snotty cheerleader type, you know, that gets her competence at the end of it. But um, I like here that uh, Haviland's allowed to be likable and that she's not a bitch. I like that scene where she's going down the hall, and Ringwald just sitting on the floor there. and, and uh, Right, and she's like, are you okay? She actually asks because she's okay. Yeah. A little compassion in the character. Well, yeah, and it's nice to do that because... Look, juxtapositions always work. Yep. Like, I was, can I tell you how happy I was when the Disney film uh, <laughs> Beauty and the Beast came out and that bitch was brunette? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, fucking thank God, finally. Finally. Mm-hmm. It's not a blonde, blue eyed, and then the bad people have brown hair and the good people have blonde hair. And, like, are we sick of this yet? Yep. Kinda. Yep. Because the world is blonde and blue eyed, right? Adolf? Like, what the fuck? Mm hmm. Sorry, that's that's pretty. That's pretty. That's a that's a lot to throw at that. But yeah, like, still, you know, I'm not scared, and I have no filter. That's what we love about you. Sadly, <laughs> yeah, I, I offend and and entertain <laughs> everywhere I go. Woo! But at least I make people think. Yeah. Right. Well, that's you part of the problem. Nobody wants to think, but that's that's the only work there actually is is in the thinking because. Thinking breeds action. Mm -hmm. So when people are out doing stuff all the time, it's because they've had a thought and a feeling that motivated them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, like, people are always, like, this world is so obsessed with the material, like, what's come out, like, the the sink, the toilet, the the window, the bank account. Where does all that come from? Mm Mm-hmm. You had to think it up, and it had to be an idea and a concept before it turned into matter. So why is everybody so obsessed with the result? Why isn't everybody creating consciously? That's I'm back right. To that. I'm sorry I keep driving it back to this, Greg, <laughs> but like it's, this is everything. There is mm-hmm. nothing without the thought that precedes it mm-hmm. or the emotion that vibes around it. There is nothing without that. And speaking of thought, you were the one that taught me how to pronounce uh, Gady's Watanabe's name. Oh, Remember I called him Gady Wannabe? Watanabe. <laughs> Gady Watanabe. Yeah. Right. He walked into that audition and he talked uh, like this uh, the whole time and he pretended he know uh, speak uh, with an accent and he talked uh, like this and oh, he was very shy and he did the whole fucking thing like that. And I think when they finally gave him the job, he was like, thanks. And they just looked at him. And he was like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I love Getty. I'm sorry, we're not closer friends. He's very close friends with Debbie Pollock. She has a big personality. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've not done well with, with big personality people because they need to take up a lot of space, which makes me just sort of sit down and be quiet. I don't need to compete. In any event... Um, she's very close with Getty. I'm sorry I'm not closer with Getty because he's a very gentle, sweet, lovely human being. Mm. But, you know, maybe if I calm down a little bit and grow up one day. We don't want you yeah, to. No, not happening. <laughs> What's your best memory of uh, John Hughes? The fact that he was such a big kid. <laughs> he knew how to have fun. Mm-hmm. I think there were other things going on. But, like, in his creative space, and, and at least for 16 Candles, I was not a part and didn't participate in any other film with him, sadly. Um, um, that didn't get to work out, which is, <laughs> I'll be accountable for that one, too. Um, but, but, like, no, he, he, he was a very, very, when he talked to you, he was very plugged in, um, connected, and very, very, very big kid, you know, very much in the moment, very much enjoyed his creative process, very much... Like, he hung out with the kids. He didn't hang out with the adults. He was hanging out with the teenagers half the time. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. He he was a very special guy. Well, he liked Molly. (laughs) Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah, he did. And he liked liked Mike. And I'm sure he'd have liked me had I not been such an (laughs) asshat. I was always the rebel, always doing stuff, jumping in the pool with all my clothes on, getting in trouble at the hotel. I just needed attention. (laughs) And I was kind of getting it the wrong way. Mm. But it was fun. The what fun w- part of that was still fun. I can't say it wasn't fun. 
Sometimes being an asshat is fun. It just is. Like, but you learn to temper it, and you know. Now, now I'm I'm into the mindful mindlessness. I try to be a little less, uh, <laughs> more mindful about my kookiness. There you go. That's all. That's all I got. What's your favorite memory from filming uh, Sixteen Candles? Mm. That's a head scratcher. <laughs> no, I mean it's not a head scratcher. Like, cause there's, it's like it all wraps up into ego stuff. Though, you know, it's like I turned 18. That was a big deal, and like in the way they celebrated it. Like I've told this story before. You know, um, they rolled the cameras, and everybody was there. And uh, like my mom had told them, oh, she can't eat sugar. She's hypoglycemic. She's like, that's like fine. So like, next thing I know, I open the door to the locker, and there's a half a watermelon with candles burning. <laughs> and I just, like, you know, the stories I heard, and here's, here's a good juxtaposition. I'm acting like an asshat. As soon as my mom left, I was just acting like such a jerk, like, you know, entitled, like, exercising my power. Like, who the fuck is she? Nobody. Oh, God. Anyway, right? Yeah. Meanwhile, <laughs> my, they've got the thing, and I was so flipped out about the idea that $10,000 a minute on a set is basically what is spent. That's what I was told, $10,000 a minute. And they're rolling, and I'm going, oh, fuck. So I just delivered my line because I was just disciplined as an actress, as, as undisciplined I was as a human being. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I just went into the scene, like, not knowing what to do. So I don't even know, like, if they have – I would love to know if they were shooting that, if they filmed that. Like, I wonder if that is in the archives or in, in some cellar someplace. That would be great to see. It didn't occur to me to think of that, like – I don't know who's even alive. I think Hilton's dead. John's dead. Ned Tannen's dead. Like, they're all dead. Everybody's dead. I'm not dead. Well, maybe I am. <laughs> Ooh. Sometimes dead is better. There's some pet cemetery. Yeah. Let's do Fred Gwynn. He's dead, too. Yeah. Stop it, you dead people. Well, Stop spe- being dead. speaking of death, you did have a lot of veteran uh, actors playing the grandparents that were... <laughs> oh, God. Edward <laughs> Andrews and Carol Baker and... Max Showalter, Billy Burt. Yep. All of those guys. Cramping poor Molly style at the house. So perky. (laughs) 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 Yep. My grandma built me up (laughs) for my 16th birthday. That's fabulous. Let's talk about trauma. (laughs) Yeah, Paul Dooley. (laughs) Yep. Trauma. It's like, you know, you go to a shrink, you're like, later in life and realize your trauma was that your grandma felt you up before a boy did you know <laughs> before you did that you did baby it's you and of course uh rosanna our cat you know love rosanna <laughs> rose is the most amazing human being she's so cool i would love to work with her she's she's on such an activist path and she's just so busy 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 you know she's she's an adorer of music she's like you know, I, I hate to use the word groupie because that's bad. She's not groupie, but she's just such a, a, an aficionado and, and like, God, she knows so much. And she's just exposed herself so much to music. She's, she's, she's a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous creature. Very interesting. Very interesting. I love how her mind works, and I love how her energy is in the world and on her Insta. I love that. I love her posts. Yeah, I've try, tried reaching out to get her on here, but I haven't heard anything back. Yeah, but. she's she's tough to get because she's so busy, you know, and and especially with you know the foundation that she's got going for Alexis, she's very much. Um, yeah, well, the Harvey Weinstein thing didn't help either. That makes things hard for me because then it, the guard goes up. You know, can I trust this person? You know, right and. That that makes it really hard for me because I'm not interested to exploit that stuff, you know. But but I just no. But people, it's such an exploitive world, like you said. Yep. Journalism, it's like the train wreck mentality and like digging up trouble. It's mm-hmm. like the gossip. It's like who gossiping. But like you know, it's like people gossip. Okay, great. Well, why do you do that? Well, you're just so unsatisfied that you have to go into somebody else's like fucking whatever. It's just such a such a low. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because Rosanna, she is such, like, I, I could just want to talk to her about her movies. Like, she is so interesting, you know? 
You know, I remember when we were shooting Baby It's You, and again, I was just a total asshole. My first movie, and my mom, we had a country house, and like my mom would be like, you're coming to the country house, and I'd be like, you can go fuck yourself, you take the country house, and go, go, you go to the country house, and I'd throw these crazy fucking parties here, like the mirrors would come off the walls, and we'd be doing cocaine, it's like, it's fucking 80s, you know, like, I'm just being wild. <sighs> What an asshole I was. Oh I'm so glad none of my kids were as awful as I was. Even put the three of them together and add all of the behavior. Like, they really didn't. I have, my kids are so good. Like, I, who had room to be bad? I was their mother. You know? how, how, how did that happen? How did you raise them so that they didn't copy you? I don't know. Like, I think the, the like, you know how you say, like, that you're so real? It's like, Mm-hmm. I've got a temper, you know, and I think it's out of fear. Like, when I get scared, like, mm-hmm. I'll yell. And, like, when the kids would go out of control, I figured if I got louder and bigger and scary, they would, I would make them stop, like whack-a-mole, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was always kind of my not-so-great technique. <clears throat> and when I would get scared and stuff, I would probably say mean stuff about their dads, the boys in particular. Um, yep. I, I, I've learned how to be a control freak really well. Um, and I'm trying to work on all that stuff. But, like, I think the fact that I was never... I never lied to them. There was never, like, sometimes in the he said, she said, I would say stuff and then pretend like I didn't, like, you know, that kind of immature stuff. But I don't think I was ever indirect with them about how I thought shit worked. Like, and if I smoke pot Mm -hmm. for my kids, like, you know, and I would tell them, look, you know, what happens in the house happens in the house. This is real. This is reality. What you're influenced by outside like, I can't control that, um, but I can tell you that what happens in my house, like, just stays in my house. It's nobody else's business, what we do, what we don't do, what we say as a family. You know, so I, I kind of raised them a little bit like that, but I was always very honest with them. Like, nudity was never an issue. Um, like, it's a very free household, and I think within that, they had a freedom to become themselves, um, mm-hmm. even though even though I was a little bit shitty. Um, <laughs> But I was young. I was 23 years old. The fucking kid having a kid. What the hell do I know? You know. So. Yeah. Well, you turned into a fun person. I think so. I love talking well, to you. I was always a fun person. Like, I remember when I was little, I used to push my stroller. I have, like, and I still do it. Like, when I walk the New York streets, if a dog happens to make eye contact with me, too bad for its owner, because I'll squat and just pet it and, like, look up at the owner and go, it's okay, then, I, you know, and thank you for letting me pet your dog. Like, I'll talk to anybody. Like, eye contact is bad because I'll just say, hi. <laughs> it's a, you know, you either get met with, like, the look of what the fuck does she want, the paranoid, scared, like, look, or people engage back. It's amazing how friendly people actually are if you access them mm-hmm. with friendliness. Yeah. Like, it's okay. Like, the one thing that I kind of knew the words. Like, you know, if I hit you, I'm hitting myself. Yeah, 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 I get it as a concept. But, like, I'm really feeling that a little bit more. I'm, like, I'm, I'm more into, like, feeling what things mean. And, like, like I said, it's like energy, vibe is everything. And, of course, you were also a girlfriend from hell. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm still a girlfriend from hell. High maintenance nightmare from hell. I'm a wife from hell. Right, Timmy? Timmy, Timmy, Timmy. I love Timmy. Timmy and I, we've, <laughs> we've walked a road, boy, I think we're 20 years now, 20 and a half years we've been married, mm-hmm. and um, we've been together 22. That's a long time, Timmy. What did you do to yourself? That's actually awesome that you guys have been married that long, especially when all they want to post in the stupid tabloids is someone so split up, you know. Uh, yeah, but too... that's more normal anymore. Like, But this is it. Like, people, I feel like... Like, this is going to get back into the mystic thing. Like, mm-hmm. You know how when babies are born, they just... When babies are born, they know everything. And then as you grow up, you like you learn 2 plus 2 is 4. You learn limitations because you're, like, in a body now. You're in a body, and now, mm-hmm. now it's not as free. You're, like, constricted in this little box. Like So you've got to deal with the physical world. But the trick is to not get so mesmerized by the physical world that you forget that it all starts in the nothing, mm-hmm. you know? Like, I, I just wish people would associate with the nothing a little bit more because I think I think it would heal the world. I really do. Can you imagine a world where everybody is just happy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then people don't have to write stories like that about so-and-so broke up. Yeah. 
you know, so and so was vibrating at such a level today that they manifested themselves like so much excess that they were able to create a community for people who are a little bit slower to to manifest stuff and who still don't don't understand how it works. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like can we just all help each other? Because all this other stuff is just, you know. And of course, you like an you like animals, and of course, you dealt with critters. Yeah, <laughs> even a crite can be tamed. Well, I, I've uh, had D. Wallace on here from the first one, and uh, I met. Also, an energy worker. Come on, man. Yeah. Like, doesn't she talk to you about like mystic shit? Everybody thinks we're all fucking peace, love, granola, and fruity, but like, good. I'm glad you think that. I I uh, had I met her at Horrorama <laughs> last year, or so it, it she remembered me, but uh, she, yeah, she did the first critters, and you were in the second critters. <laughs> Did you uh, get to see the manufacturing of the critters? No. No? I know the Kyoto's pretty well. <laughs> I kind of had fun with them at Spooky Empire. <laughs> I wish they had put my table a little closer to theirs, because I think I might have might have made a little more money. But um, that did stop me. There was a, a convention goer named Mike Fortin mm-hmm. and his, uh, his boyfriend, Doug. And Doug uh, rides around on one of those electric scooters. Mm-hmm. And so they were kind of friendly, and they came talk to me at the table. And I realized that, you know, I had a and a and that was a lot of fun. Apparently, I was complimented because nobody walked out. <laughs> Apparently, a lot of people walk out of Q&As, but I held my audience. Well, I kind of flipped it back on them. They started asking me questions, and I was like, well, here, let's, let's flip it. You. <laughs> I just on somebody in the audience. I was like, what's your deal? That's your girlfriend right there? I just started heckling them. I don't know what possessed me. Anyway, I had a great time. Oh, gee, I think that would be awesome. That's the thing we like about you, you know? Not <laughs> conventional ever. No, I know. Well, so then it was time for the Kyoto Brothers to do their Q&A. Mm-hmm. So they were sitting there, and I think, um, who else was there? Oh, gosh. Anyway, they were doing their Q&A, and the, uh, the moderator knew. The moderator knew. I, I waited for them to all sit down, and then I, like, crawled on stage on all fours and, like, looked at the audience and put my finger up, like, shh. <laughs> so they're laughing. And, you know, I'm sure everybody on the Q&A didn't know why they were laughing, but they just kind of weren't paying attention because they were just sort of all settling. Then the Q&A starts. And she says, I want to introduce the Kyoto Brothers. And then I just would kept popping up behind them and, like, waving. I was just doing crazy stuff. <laughs> Did they yeah. catch you? <laughs> Eventually. Like, it, it kind of blew up because somebody said something, and it just kind of blew the surprise a little bit too soon. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, no, that's, that's just, just, I will punk you. <laughs> just watch out. Like, don't leave your Facebook open on your phone when you go to the bathroom and leave the phone in front of me. Because I'll post something stupid. <laughs> I'm that guy. I am that guy. Don't do it. What's your memories of uh, Mary Warren of in Rock and Roll High School forever? She was a grown-up. We didn't talk to her, dude. Like, okay. why am I talking to grown-ups? Like, <laughs> even though I had a toddler, not toddler, I had an infant. Like, how old was Tyler when I did that? He, was, he wasn't even one year, he wasn't even a year old. Mm-hmm. You did you mingle a lot with Corey Feldman? Sort of. He was busy doing heroin. So. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. He was, he was too busy. And then poor Karen. Like, she's the one that, uh, you know, I had an African gray parrot, and then I had two kids, and then my husband at the time didn't like it. And <clears throat> Sorry, Logan. Sorry, Jim. I probably should have gotten rid of Jim, <laughs> not the bird. But I got rid of the bird because, you know, I wanted to make the, the, the guy happy because that's what you're supposed to do, right? You make the guy happy? Yeah. Yeah, no, go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, I make me happy, and when I'm happy, I'll attract a guy who's not a fucking dickhead like my husband. There you go. There you go. years later. So, anyway, um, <laughs> um, uh-oh, hold on. Yeah? I have to check on my mom. Hold on. Sure. Now, this is pretty good. We, we got a little... We got a little distance without this. Do you need me to put Fraser or something on for you? No, it's, 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 it's very Here, hold on a second. Hey, sure. Gary, hold on. Say yep. hi to my mom. Mom, this is Gary Gilbert. Gary Greg Gilbert. Gilbert. Is viewing me because it's the 35th anniversary of 16 Candles, and I told him that you're a jazz composer, so why don't you talk to him for a second? Oh, 
I'll talk to you for a second. How are you doing, Paulette? I'm I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing great. So you like uh, jazz music, huh? Well, yeah, and people used to record my stuff, like, you know, uh, uh, the, the saxophonist who was so popular briefly. Yeah. What? Coltrane, that's right. Mm-hmm. Coltrane has recorded me. Uh, Carmen McRae has recorded my stuff. And yeah. I feel like a very lucky, really lucky person. <laughs> well, you get a wonderful daughter. I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favor of your daughter's movies? A what? Of the movies that Leanne was in, do you have any favorites? Of movies that she was in, well, I don't know. I thought uh, her of my favorite movies of mine. I thought um, maybe it's you. Baby, it's you was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's hard for me to tell. I love all of them. If she's in it, it's a great movie. <laughs> oh, she she is uh, awesome. Like, uh, I, I love the fact she's very honest, very real. I, I, this is my second time having your daughter on my she's show. A good actor. She yes. A very good actor. Yep. But and I love her there. realism. Yep. Yeah, it's just great. No, she's doing very, very well. At, to our surprise, we've been discovering that she's one hell of a business li- business person. Yeah. And yep. that goes down very well. Anyway, I'm very glad you're interviewing her. Yeah, this is my second time having her on. I had, And uh, uh, the reason I had her on was not so much for 16 Candles' 35th anniversary. It's just she's so entertaining and real. I love that she has no filter. I love the fact that she's real, you know. <laughs> That's what I like about her, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you get the well, real... There are, she is appreciated by a good, good number of people, I think, and all for the same reasons. Yeah. Fucking nuts. <laughs> she's, she's nuts. I, 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 I know she sometimes try, tries to get on your nerves, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so when you did jazz music, what was uh, your favorite? favorite uh, instrument to play do you have anything you you enjoy i don't play an instrument oh don't don't play an instrument okay i am strictly a composer i write music okay but when people ask me well will you sing i say but i'm not a i'm not a singer okay but i i rec- i've recorded some stuff because i wanted to get a tune to some a favorite uh, artist of mine so i have on occasion sung a song but i don't consider myself to be a uh, a singer, you know, like a singer, singer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, that that's great. So, um, gee, you you were doing that. Uh, I I know I read up on you. You were doing that way back. Uh, oh, I might get this wrong. Was it, is it safe to say the forties or the fifties? I fifties. I would say the fifties. Okay. She's nodding. <laughs> she used to call me up and say, listen, give me some of your titles. And sure enough, she starts digging up my work, laid claim to by somebody who had no right to the rights. Yep. And so I think we, we may find ourselves getting back a few copyrights that belong to me. Yes, I think so, so yes. Like, she's pushing for that. How dare they? And I say the same thing, go write your own songs. I agree, <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, she thinks that's funny. <laughs> Are you going to write a song about Leanne? <laughs> I haven't yet, but I might write a song about Leanne, and then we'll all be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> so that's, anyway, I'm glad that you're interviewing her. Oh, yeah, and it's nice to talk to you as well. Thank you, thank you. Or I'm going to pass you back to Leanne. Okay, you have a nice day. I I appreciate uh, talking to you. You take care. You too. Yeah. Back to you, back to you. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. (laughs) Yes. Well, hello there. Oh, that was wonderful. I thought I was going to have to edit there, but you know what? I like that. (laughs) 
You know what? I'll send you some MP3s. Like that way you can uh, you can hear her music if you want. I'll send you some music. Oh sure, absolutely. I'll send you the one that Carmen recorded. I can send you links to the YouTube. Thing. Okay. Because um, I don't have an MP3 of the Coltrane, Train, I don't think, but I've got links to YouTube. That way, everybody can go see. It's not just like a. But I can send you MP3s of her demos that she talked about. It's funny; she was very cogent about everything, and she pretty much paralleled everything that I said very mm-hmm. well. Which makes me wonder whether, you know, being the fact that I've been managing my client, Paulette Gerard. I'd like to get her some telephone interviews because if she held her own, that was okay. On a good day, she'd be fine. There you go. Yeah, that. Because uh... you know, I definitely want to get her branding up and out there. I want her name out there. I want to make a stink about my mom in a good way before she croaks. I want her to croak out of here, you know, feeling feeling satisfied. I really, I want her to have some kind of satisfaction before she splits. Okay. Right now, it's. It's uh, I'm fighting that depressive uh, thought pattern that she's had for such a long time, and it's really hard to get people to change. So I don't want to get her to change, but if I can change myself enough to make the world feel a little different for her on her way out, I would be so privileged, honored, and feel like so fucking satisfied. <laughs> well, she sounded great uh, when I was talking to her there, and... Uh... You know, I th- nice clarity. I I think that uh, I think she's happy with you. She is until we get into it about you know stop thinking negative thoughts and I'll just like stalk. It's like okay, I can't even deal with you right now, and I'll just like literally stop talking and walk right out of the room, which is better than like yelling. You know, because then when I get upset and I start getting emphatic like about trying to make a point that she can't wrap her mind around, like you know. I just don't, it makes me sad that my mom's so not satisfied on so many levels, you know, and Mm -hmm. I have to also watch that I'm not projecting my dissatisfaction on her, because she showed me how to project all of her stuff on me. So, like, I feel like, you know, if you were, you know how when you were in school, and you were in science class, Mm -hmm. and um, a teacher, like, would put a tree and draw a circle around it, and then put, like, a bush and draw a circle around it, and then the circle's kind of, like, crisscrossed in the middle Yep. because both of those things had certain attributes that were the same. Mm -hmm. So I feel like my fear vibration as it comes out angry is wrapped into her fear vibration, which comes out like victim-y. So the two of us are in this weird vibration symbiosis where like I'm addicted to feeling angry sometimes or feeling guilty. Mm -hmm. I'll exhibit behavior so that I can like feed the addiction, you know, and that's the old me. I don't need to feed my guilt addiction. I don't need to feed my anger addiction. Like, I don't need to do that. Like, why? It doesn't, like, if I need to love myself, behaving like that puts me in stress. And if I'm in stress, then I'm creating more stress. And like, if, and then it just it snowballs the wrong ways. So I want to be in joy. I want to be in happy. And I'm, I'm trying to learn. And it's really hard to learn with somebody who's so stuck. Like, so I find myself getting very impatient, like, you're ruining it for me. It's like, no, like, nobody's ruining it for you. You're you're using her to give yourself an excuse to not work harder. Shut up. Like, mm-hmm. so I'm just trying so hard to take accountability, and hopefully she's not getting too battered <laughs> in it. Like, I mean, not battered in the sense of physical, like, I'm not battering anybody, mm-hmm. you know, but it's just, it just emotional turbulence can sometimes be more painful than yeah. any kind of a strike you could get physically, you know? Mm-hmm. Is there so, be I don't know. We're all just working it out. Like, yeah, it, it's the real work, in my opinion, in a lifetime is to work out that kind of stuff. Is there going to be know? any uh, conventions come up where you, uh, like a Comic Con or something, where you uh, get together with other cast members of 16 Candles? or is that I don't happening? know. Like, there's still time like i'm thinking like because chiller is such a last minute thing and if i live in new york like and i feel i feel my way around chiller like now maybe this is just like a a practice chiller Mm -hmm. because it's so last minute but if i could figure out how to get scott grimes like that dude has never i don't think he's ever done a sign or a convention like i don't know but like if i could figure out how to collab with him like because we both write music and we used to sing all the time when we were getting our makeup on we used to sing this one song um, a John Farnham song. Like, I don't know who's familiar with John Farnham. Maybe up in Canada, you guys, more, more so here. 
Um, but um, we used to harmonize all the time. He'd sing lead, and I'd go up higher. I was like, can I just have fun? I love harmonizing. That's one of the best things. I used to love singing in choir because of the harmonies and the stacked harmonies. And when I um, when I produce stuff, I could actually send you something something that I'm not ashamed of, something that I'm kind of proud of. I did a cover of um, the Rolling Stones' "Give Me Shelter." Okay. You know, and it's kind of all over the place. But I think that that definitely um, <laughs> represents the all over the placeness and and the multi multi. Like I just the way I hear stuff. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I swear to God, if somebody were to have given me a test, like back when I was younger, and I don't mean this in an insulting way, or I don't mean this to sound like, you know, oh, look at me, I'm special, but because everybody's special, and yes, look at me, and look at you, and look at all of us. We should all feel like, look at me, I'm special, but not in a conceited way. But, yeah, you know, I really feel like, um, <coughs> well, now I've just derailed myself, because I didn't want to sound like a total jerk. <laughs> um <laughs> We're all very unique people, though. Like, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I, 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 I was just the way I hear stuff. Harmonies, stacked harmonies. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I know you've uh, done a good job with your mom, you know. I, I th- I'm guessing that's what's taking you out of uh, um, the industry so, somewhat, because you haven't uh, worked. Well, yeah, first yeah. it was my kids, and now I'm home with my mom, mm-hmm. you know. It's like, Wow. And it was funny, too, because, like, the kids had just sort of, Jackie had just moved out, and I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do now? Like, hmm, what was I doing before I had kids? Let me drive a lift for a little while and sort of figure it out, you know? And then um, then my mom fell down and broke her leg, and then I came out here for what I thought was going to be two weeks. It turned into eight, and I was, like, horrified. And then I went back to L.A., and then I came back out um, for another few weeks and then I, I got my daughter to stay here for six weeks so then I came back at the end of six weeks to come pick her up and then we went back to LA and then I was freaked out and just couldn't deal with it and then I stayed in LA till like May then I came back for two weeks and freaked out again and went back to LA came back here last November for her birthday for her 95th birthday stayed about 10 days went home came back December 1st and thought okay I'll stay like another two weeks and then she looks up at me and says I think I'm going to be alone at Christmas. And I went, oh, fuck. (laughs) Really? Fuck. Fuck. Uh, Okay, I thought I I just got a 296 round trip ticket. Like, that's cheap. Like, but like, if I try to go home at Christmas time, I'm going to $200 change ticket fee, like, and keep going. And it's like this $296 ticket which is less than $150 one way, this $147 ticket or whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, is going to turn into a $900 ticket. So I had to fucking wait. I, I called my husband. I was like, okay, so if I stay here for Christmas, that means I'm basically trapped here till January 10th when the flight prices drop again. Well, I ended up staying right through till January 24th, I went home. I played the National Association of Music Manufacturers Convention. I played bass with Jack, and we were invited again. Lovely company, Sennheiser. I love them. They have the best products, and I have the great fortune of being able to use all of my Sennheiser products when I record my music. Um, Pop notch. Anyway, so I flew back there, and then I was home for a week, and... and, um, I called back to New York. I was like, do you guys mind if I stay an extra week? And I'm sure the people who were watching my mom were horrified, but they, of course, said, sure, of course, you stay. I'm like, yeah, okay, I will. Um, And then I ended up bringing one of my African gray parrots back with me because being here in my mom's house, like after having 28 birds, two cats, and a dog, you come back here to, like, it's a fucking mausoleum, and I couldn't fucking deal with it. I just needed my cat, my pet, my something. Like, so I've got Diva Bird here with me. Um, Right, Diva Bird? Diva, what are you? Go on. Hi. Hi, Diva. (laughs) That's right. So Licorice and Greystoke, my other two African greys, are back home with my husband, along with, like, two flocks of parakeets and a black-headed kaik. Mm -hmm. Um, My daughter's cat, his Yorkshire Terrier, which is our Yorkshire Terrier, but, like, really it's his because he loves it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so yeah, so they're all back there with him, and he's got to find a place to move, and I have no idea how that looks because I'm all the way over here and kind of can't like. But so instead of stressing out, 
Like, here's the weird magic thing. I'm going, instead of flipping out about what the physical reality looks like and allow that to trigger me into being completely stressed out, mm-hmm. I'll just go, literally, get on my bike for an hour, sweat my knot balls off, um, and get the <laughs> calories out so that I can gorge on chocolate at 3 in the morning and not feel guilty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we have the earthquake emergency stash in the bedroom, always. So my friend Tracy Lambert used to call it, Leanne, what is this by your bed? And I would just look at her. I'd be like, I don't know, it's munchies, the one I have the munchies at four. And she's like, it's your earthquake emergency stash. Don't lie. I'm like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Right next to the bong, all the chocolate. <laughs> it's like, come on. One goes with the other, right? Of course it does. Anyway. You... So, you had mentioned uh, playing music. You, you played your own music in rock and roll high school forever, did you not? Yeah, that's one of the things that got me the job is because I actually knew how to play guitar. I remember Deb squinting at me going, I've got a bullshit detector on right now. Like, you really play, right? And I'm like, yeah, I really play. She's like, are you sure? Because my bullshit detector's on. I said, you just said that. Like, yeah, I play guitar. Mm-hmm. Where's a guitar? You want me to play guitar right now? She's like, no, no. Just want to make sure you're telling the truth. I'm like, come on, acting's all about being a really fucking amazing liar. But no, I play the guitar. <laughs> Classically trained, babe. You know, sadly, my mom, I remember that. I wanted an electric guitar. She would not. Nope. I got a classical guitar. And I was so pissed. Like, how do you get angry at somebody for giving you a gift of a guitar? Because it wasn't the one I wanted. Like, there's always been this struggle with my mom and me, man. I'll tell you. <laughs> Even when I was a kid. Ah, oh, it's so funny. Dynamic. They could almost do a sitcom on you and your mom. Uh, you can't oh, really... I've got one. I've oh, already dude. got one. We've got one because <laughs> the roommate, one of the roommates, but she's not really, not roommate, but she, she's, <laughs> she's the one who's here taking care of mom while I'm, like, off in California freaking out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so she, 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 she's been here caregiving, um, but she happens to be about five feet tall, She shaves her head bald most of the time. Um, She's autistic. She's a teaching artist. She works with kids. Uh, She wears black all the time. She's also a fabulous bartender. She's a writer. She's very, very, very smart. I'm sure her IQ is like, you know, 700. She's so fucking smart. Um, So she's quite a character because she's just, she's she's not, like when I say atypical, I mean it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but she's great, you know. I trust her with my mom, which is huge. So anyway, um, Shannon lives here. Okay. And um, then we've we've got a friend who happens to be a jazz guitarist who I allow to stash his stuff in the back room because he plays in town a lot, and his 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 space was compromised with some some demo and construction and. He's got an interesting situation, so he just needed a place to put his, quote, stuff. I'm like, that's okay. So he comes in and out because he has to play his guitar and practice, and he just uses the room to do that. Then there's me. Then there are all my animals. Then there's the daughter, and if you'll remember, I said something that's like kind of like postcards from the edge, but, you know, without <laughs> cocaine, and then add a generation and a whole shit ton of animals. And the most patient man in the whole wide world, who's my husband, the, you know, will call her a roommate for the purpose of the show, and then the other roommate... And then the crazy old lady, like, it's, it's, it writes itself. Like, I just need a showrunner to come sit with me for long enough to get it developed and not pay me off to go fuck off because they have a track record and I don't. So we're manifesting that. That'll happen when it's supposed to. It'll be a fabulous show, and it's going to have to be on Showtime because there's no way I'm not ripping bong hits and cursing. <laughs> I don't blame you. Yeah, no. Don't it's, blame you. It will be the truth. Yep. It will. Yeah, I'm not. A, I'm not a fan of censorship. So, well, good because Facebook clearly is a fan of censorship. Let me get to this. Like I started talking to you before about Eddie and Stephanie, like Eddie Delange, the songwriter. If I'm lucky, mm-hmm. my mom's song's called "If I'm Lucky." Parenthesis, I'll be the one. Mm-hmm. The Delange's daddy wrote a song for a movie called "If I'm Lucky." It's the title song. They were commissioned by the studio to write the song, and he wrote it with a guy named Joseph Myro. Mm-hmm. So. Fine, they've got that song. Yep. Um, that's great. So I, 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 when my mom said that 
comment about how, you know, I used to tell her this song and that song, and, and Leanne said finally, like, she would look it up, and that's, that's a true story. Like, here comes the postcards from the Edge story. I'm telling my mom about how fantastically talented her 11-year-old grandchild is. Mm-hmm. And she's like, that's just fabulous. What happened to my song? I'm like, Mom, I'm telling you about your granddaughter. Could you not just, like, make it about you? Why does everything <laughs> always have to end up about you? Like, what is that? She's like, well, you don't have to get it. <laughs> and then, like, okay, so now we're not going to take accountability for what we just said and launch into the next subject before the first subject. Like, this is what I'm talking about. My mom's never taken accountability for her behavior. It drives me <laughs> in fucking insane. Like, I grew up thinking and feeling like I was nuts. But no, really, she's the master derailer and de- distractor and deflector. But it's so good that I'm finding this out because, like, what freedom I have from realizing that we're back to that little circle and that, like, weird little football-shaped thing where we're inter... No. No mas. Anyway, so um, I'm at this place, like, and my friend Rick, who's become my friend and mentor in Detroit, has a client named Kathy Cousins. And I'm on the internet with my mom. She's like, well, what about my songs? I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, just give me a fucking title. She's like, tiptoe gently. So I go on Google, and I find this thing, and then I click the, you know how you go on iTunes, and you can click the little thing to sample the song. Yep. And I'm like, okay, is this this the right song? She's like, that's my song. How did you do that? It's like, it's called magic. It's called the fucking Google. It's called the World Wide Web in my my usual flip tone. Like, (laughs) you know, I, I, I was always like the sitcom flip tone response. Like, you know. <laughs> so there's no chance that your your husband's going to move down there to New York with you? No, <laughs> I don't expect him to do that. His life is in California, and his and my in-laws are elderly, and he needs to be around them. Oh, that's okay. That's So how did you and he meet? Uh, a friend of mine said, I can't do the divorce for you and your husband because... Um, I know you, but there's a dude in my office. He could probably do it. Um, and I said, okay. And then he made a comment like, God, if the two of you started dating, that would be something. And I was like, oh, come on, come off it. So then the guy comes over, and there's crisis at my house. Um, and I'm homebound with a kid who's got a broken leg, and it was just it was a fucking mess. Mm-hmm. So he comes over, and he just sort of you know, as lawyers do when they check out cases or whatever, um, starts asking me a couple questions, and, you know, here I am with, I've been home, my legs are completely, like, hairy, and I'm wearing shorts, and I'm looking at him going, got an extra cigarette? (laughs) Looking aggressive (laughs) and crazy, right? Totally just, like, a mess. And he's like, yeah. So he took some some, some notes, and the next thing I know, um, I'm hiring him to deal with my divorce, um... And that's fine. And then I started thinking, like, well, this guy is kind of fun. Like, so he takes me to lunch. And then I think, like, I hadn't even known him, like, six weeks. And I'm in the car. We're in the car park. He's going to take me to the Westwood Marquee for lunch. Park in the car, and we're going around in the parking lot structure trying to find a space. (coughs) And it's quiet. And it's an awkward, quiet moment. And I just turn around, and I look at him. I was like, look, I've got two little kids. I'm coming off of a crazy marriage, like, and you could be a serial killer for all I know, pretending you're a fucking attorney. Like, I don't have time for bullshit. So if you're just, like, looking for dating and lighthearted fun, I'm not your gal. And he just looked at me like, what the fuck? (laughs) I'm taking you to lunch. Like, what? (laughs) Clearly, I had him, I had him at, (laughs) are you a serial killer? (laughs) 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 I think that was it. That was it for him. Like, I don't know. Like, and then the poor bastard decided to just come join forces, and here we are, 22 years later. That is fantastic. (laughs) And I'm here meditating on the 15th floor of a luxury building with a fabulous view. Like, you know, couldn't make it up if I wanted to. (laughs) I think that's great you two have been together that long. Like I said, you'd... Uh, you don't. You hear so much today about divorces and divorce and divorces. I love hearing stories about people that stay together. Like my folks have been together. It's a matter of being fucking lazy. Like yep. I don't know. Yeah. Like too lazy to make a change. Making big changes is scary, but like really, it's not. I've discovered mm-hmm. it's, it's just, it. It actually accelerates stuff and and allows people to to change patterns. 
you know, like put yourself in a completely new physical situation. Try to be the same person. It doesn't work. <laughs> hmm. Well, you know what, Leanne? It, uh, it was it so does. so fantastic having you come back on here today. Well, I was wondering. I was wondering, do you have anything else you want to share, like any web pages or any updates or or anything you want to promote on here? Um, well, just you know, keep your eyes open for a show called a show called Riding the Frequency. Keep your eyes open for that. Um, some of the call waiting is going, so I keep trying to wait for it to get done and then say full sentences so it's not all chopped up. <laughs> um, but yeah, keep your eyes open for a Riding the Frequency. F R E A K W E N C Y. Who knows in the next few months to a year hopefully i'll have my shit together on that speaking of which i need to open up my logic program then finish writing my um my i don't know if i can call it spoken word but it, it's something it's not exactly sung and then i'll just go do my singing I, i've been scared to like just jump in and do it like so maybe maybe after this weekend i will have a theme song and if i'm happy with it i'll even post it you sing yeah I do all of it, but I just I'm in the closet about it. I'm actually performing with my friend Jude, um, Jude Roberts, another fabulous singer-songwriter. He's he's up in Rosendale and Woodstock area right now. That's where he's that's where he's living. Um, but he's going to come down. I helped him record one of his songs a few weeks back. We're going to finish that up, and then we're going to finish recording one of my mom's songs that um, I think needs to be a duet. Mm -hmm. She had a male version and a female version. The song's called Ooh Ooh Baby. And, okay. you know, the verses are pretty much insulting each other, and then there's, like, a breakdown in the middle, and then there's an outro and stuff. So I've got it all ready. I'm going to make him sing the boy part. And when that's ready, I'm going to put that out, too. It'll be fabulous. It's one of my mom's unpublished songs that I get to control. Nice. <laughs> yep. I'm excited. Who Who are your uh, influences in terms of uh, music and singing? Oh, gosh. I would say that's Peter Gabriel, and that's Rosanna Arquette's fault. No, that's not true. <laughs> Rosanna turned me on to Genesis, and The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. Um, but somebody who is very dear to me who is no longer with us, more absent friends, so many absent friends, Paul Morell, he turned me on to Peter Gabriel. Mm -hmm. So I've always listened to a lot of Peter Gabriel, which also comes full circle to Rosanna, because I think she dated him for a minute, and those two, those two have a very interesting... Um, I think cosmically those two are interwoven. Those, those, they're not separable. I don't know. It's some, there, there's a definite connection between the two of them that's like a forever and a before and an after thing. Like that's, that's, that's cosmic to me. I don't know if she'll ever hear me or this interview, but hey, Ro, so special. You're such a special human being. Anyway. Um, well, hopefully eventually. Yeah, like Peter Gabriel. Um, I listened to some Almond Brothers when I was younger, but like, um, yes, I listened to a lot of Yes and The Who. Um, fabulous song by Tracy Bonham called Mother, Mother. I've always wanted to, to, to cover that, but I don't know that I could do better, just different, and I still haven't worked out what it is that I want to do. But like, Give Me Shelter, I'll send you that as an example of what I do to songs. <laughs> they don't come out normal. <laughs> they don't come out anything the way they, come, they were in the first place. Well, what I can do, I could send you my email address, and uh, you could sure, send those. You can swap samples of each of them in if you want to. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, um, if you want me to, I can even play them on my live show if you want me to. That would be great. Yeah. Yep, we, we can uh, get crazy yeah, with Leanne. There, somebody, we get creative, man. Like, somebody wants to... to Seriously, I would love somebody to want to license the song Give Me Shelter and not have enough money to pay Mick Jagger and come find my version because it's just so weird. I want it in a movie. Well, you know what? That should happen. Do you ever, ever write screenplays before? Like, did you... No, but I've got two fully finished stories in my head, and like I've got the whole thing. I mean, I see it, so I just have to. It's a matter of sitting down and writing it. Mm -hmm. But one thing I haven't been ready to do yet. And I'll know when I'm ready, because when I'm ready, it'll happen. Yeah. It will. And even if I have to talk it into something. But yes, I've got, I've got um, a, a comedy horror called Dino Keat. Okay. <laughs> and I've got um, a feature film about my mom and like just one, one part of her life that was very exciting and different and true. And I've got like newspaper articles and books like, you know, spies and communist plots to take over Paris happening in 1948, 49, 50. Mm -hmm. 
So there was very exciting times. There were a lot of expats over there playing music in Paris at that time. A lot of people from America were there. Um, Kenny Clark went over there, and, you know, uh, just a lot of people were there. Who would you get to play your mom? My daughter. Okay. Who would play you? If you want to. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. Alex Bornstein. Like I would, like the way Alex Bornstein manages uh, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. That's mm. like so me. That's like the man. That's what managed Jacqueline. I was like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you watch that show, but like if I'm a manager, I go into Alex Bornstein mode. Like it's not even funny. It's ridiculous. I'm like such an asshole. But like you have to be sometimes. Just hardcore. Absolutely. Like, no green M and M's. What? Okay. Oh, you're eating M and M's right now. Rider. <laughs> <laughs> well, Leanne, one of the things I love about you, like I said, you have no filter, and it's nice Thank to God. talk to real people who are not afraid to speak their mind. And um, you know, I I could go on and say, well, we're celebrating 16 candles, 35th anniversary. But frankly, no, but I think we're celebrating Leanne and her nutsiness. Well, you know what? That was why I wanted to have you back on. I was like, you know, I could throw this out as an excuse, but I just wanted to have you back on. Well, we can pretend it's about 16 candles, but really it's all about me. That's right. That's the way it should be. It's all about life. you. Well, but Greg, you know what? In your life, it should be all about Greg. And like in a friendly, happy, loving, self-loving way, because that's the way it should be. Mm-hmm. It's fun. Too sad. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. And instead of baby, it's you. It's baby, it's Leanne. Baby, it's me. That's right. <laughs> now there, there's I'll a move around saying that. Thank you, John and Maggie, because baby, c'est moi. It's <laughs> moi. <laughs> baby, c'est moi. Bonjour, je m'appelle Leanne. Oh gee. You, you... Oh yeah, I'm fluent in French. I can read and write, and I can speak. And um, yeah, literal, figurative. All the French. I speak all of it. <laughs> uh, I'm fluent in English and five o'clock traffic language. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I I know you're fluent in the five o'clock traffic language. <laughs> yes, I have been. Well, look, dude, I learned how to I learned how to drive because I used to steal my mom's car from the garage and drive down to CBGB's. And I would drive down Ninth Avenue and like you know, cabs would try to cut me off. I'd try to cut them off. It was a big fucking game. It's like driving is like a video game. You steal your mother's car and you get downtown, right? Yep. <laughs> just just, well, just you don't kill anybody. Yeah, okay? don't do any Grand Theft Auto stuff. <laughs> well, you know, I side. <laughs> I still see my friend Lewis who was in the car with me when I sideswiped an ambulance right in front of a police precinct and decided the smart thing to do would be to accelerate and get the fuck out of there. <laughs> <laughs> to which the response from the universe was two undercover cops literally diving onto the hood of my car with their badge out, like doing like sideways diving across my like something out of a fucking movie. And my friend Lewis is like, Leanne, just fucking pull over. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> my mom was out at the fucking Philharmonic, and my 80 something year old grandma had to walk down to 82nd Street and between Amsterdam and Columbus. <laughs> I'm 93rd and Broadway, right? And I've got this policeman, Officer Davis. God only knows if he's there. He's probably the sergeant now. Like, <laughs> and he's there. It's February 13th. I remember this because he gives me a chocolate-covered heart and says, you know, I see how anxious you are, but if you don't act like this between now and the time you turn 16 in July, uh, there'll be nothing on your record, and it'll be fine. Just don't, please just stop. I'm like, okay. Like, did I stop? No, I just didn't get caught again. Like, <laughs> God. Did you get any more yeah. chocolate-covered hearts? Not from Officer Davis, but I didn't get any tickets from him either, which is the more important thing. I can get my own damn chocolate. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, that that is funny. No, that, um, yes. What, what, how old were you in that? Fifteen and a half when that happened. Fifteen. You see, uh, I would never have dared do something like it that. So. Of course not. Nobody would. This is why everybody's mom was like, her? You don't hang out with her. You No, you're busy after school. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, right. Leanne, it was... The ab <laughs> <laughs> It was... You know, ab I tried to say goodbye so many times, it just doesn't work. 
Goodbye, Greg. You know what? It was wonderful having you on. Yeah, we're coming up on 90 minutes here. Yeah. Animals. It's the animal show. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. That's what we love about you. (laughs) That's right. Actually, I should ask this. Out of every film you've done, what is your best experience and what was your worst experience? Um, hmm. My worst experience was probably um, film or TV or just anything. Anything. All right. Well, I was hired to be on Herman's head. Mm-hmm. And the gag didn't work because I wasn't like Playboy Bunny ish enough. I was just like this skinny, like, I don't know. I just wasn't sex pot enough. So, like, after rehearsal one day, I got in the car and, like, the body's not even cold. And they're just like, you know, they're replacing you. I was like, they're, wait, what? What? So, like, I still feel like kind of, I don't feel embarrassed anymore but like the pit of my stomach i just like sunk like what did i do like i really like i i took that on so personally it was really awful Mm -hmm. um and i don't remember what episode it was i remember what the scene was but i couldn't tell you what episode maybe i have it in some old address book someplace but unlike my mother i think i threw all my old address books out which is stupid because now actually flipping back to my mom i can see where she was in 1948 and with whom so even if she gets, like, forgetful, I've got it all written down. The timeline has already been made for me. It's there. I don't have to, I don't have to make anything up. Gee, you could do a book. Well, this is what I'm saying. It's like I, this, this apartment here, mm-hmm. it, I'm fully, my intention is to turn this apartment into an incubator. Already it's an incubator of shifting of energy and frequencies. Then it will be an incubator and a development spot like this Natalia Ferrara. Mm-hmm. She's going to be an amazing filmmaker. I have my bets on this girl, dude. Um, so she's down at NYU, like I said. So, so we're going to make some magic this summer, I hope. I hope that doesn't get derailed, and I hope she doesn't decide to do something else, because I would love to work with this girl. Um, so, yeah, conjure that universe. And you, what about your best ever experience on film or television? <sighs> Deep thought. <laughs> It's like really kind of an ego, like the, the, the ego based part of me wants to say the fact that when I was in Canada and in Toronto at the film festival, mm-hmm. I went into a meditation and I swear to God, I heard the judge go and the winner of the grand prize of the Americas. And then I heard him say it in French, the kid brother, like, and I woke up out of that and I was like, that was really fucking trippy. So then I go to the press conference when they're giving out the prizes, and third prize goes out to some film, second prize goes out to some film, the other prize goes out to some film, and I'm like, okay, well, I guess we're done. And then I hear the guy, just like in my fucking dream, go, and the Grand Prix of the Toronto, like, to the, and the goosebumps are like all up on my legs, my back, the hackles. Like, this is how you know you're in tune with capital IT, it, okay? Like, I heard this fucking thing happen. I knew, like, I I heard. I heard in my dreams. And the same fucking guy, same voice, same words, same everything. I had a precognitive experience. Like, I've never had that before. I was so in tune with what was going on up there. It was ridiculous. So not from a creative standpoint, but from a tuned-in standpoint, that's the most amazing experience I've ever had with relation to a film that I participated in. Oh, fantastic. So, however many complaints there were about the film and the making of that film, and there were plenty. Um, to this day, I've never seen a fucking residual. And it yeah. won the Moscow Grand Prize and the Toronto Grand Prize, and these fucking crooks in Japan, you know, sorry. But you know what? People should get paid for the work that they've done. They should. I hear a lot about this stuff, about people not getting residuals. Yeah, like my dad never, ever got residuals on Speed Racer or Marine Boy. Oh, wow. Like, we're still waiting for that. Hello, you guys. Kid brother, like, right down the line. SAG has had some pretty good experiences with their legal team, but then there have also been the lame experiences of which Speed Racer and the kid brother are two. Sadly. Sadly. But that's okay, because honestly... Everything evens out. So whatever I didn't get from that and from them, I will get multiplied abundantly from some other project. 
and maybe have the satisfaction of having my own production company there someday you go. with many with many like the TV department uh, many arms like the music department the TV department and even if it's a small something it'll be mine 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 and I can control what comes out comes out comes out comes out mm-hmm. and I can always have some element of energy and frequency work within it so what, it's what, okay I'm just getting ready to get ready to get ready to get ready what do you get the best uh, residuals from um, Benny and June and 16 Candles. Okay. Okay. Yay, Johnny Depp. <laughs> mm, what a nice guy. Yep. Yep. I met him on 21 Jump Street. I think, did I tell you this on the last go-round? I think I have. He, he remembered me. Oh, he yeah? He me from 21 Jump Street at the table read. Okay. I don't know if he just, like, went and did his homework before the table read or if he just actually remembered me. But, like, my experience of Johnny Depp, kind quiet, gentle, connected. And this is before like energy work and all this. I don't think he was even like he just he's just very present and not fear based. It doesn't feel like I've heard good things about Johnny Depp in terms of yeah. uh yeah. Yeah, very well well tempered energy. Mm-hmm. I don't know that he's as outwardly frisky as I am, but he's he's definitely somebody who who um He's content. I feel like he's a content, content soul, which is why he's he's never, like, aside from one weird thing that I heard, like, when it's a wife and they started to fight, like, the little bit of train wreck stuff, skirmish thing that happened, but, like, I don't even know what that was about. I don't remember, mm-hmm. you know, and what happens between people is really kind of between them and, like, yep. why, you know, yuck. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I read a lot up on... Uh, uh, Autograph Collector magazine. I used to read that when it was in town, and and I always like to see who's friendly and who's not. Johnny Depp was always on the friendly list. Oh wow, there are actually lists of 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 us. Yep. And is Molly Ringwald on the friendly list? Yeah, uh, unfortunately not. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think she would be. Nope. Well, I know I is read. There a vet? I can yeah. tell you this, and I don't know if Molly will ever hear this, but yeah. she should know. We have a vet. She had a little Pomeranian that went in for a broken leg, and nobody exactly knew how the leg got broken, and nobody was really insinuating anything egregious. But when the nanny came to pick up the dog, um, and the two kids were running around the front room, and the vet came out to talk to the nanny about um, how to care for the dog once the dog went home, the nanny proceeded to not make eye contact with the vet and was watching and trying to control the kids while the vet was trying to give, you know, go home instructions for a dog who was in a fucking cast. It's a little dog. Like, okay, so the vet stopped talking. And the assistant finally turned around and looked at the vet like, why'd you stop talking? I got to get out of here and go home with the dog. Like I'm on a schedule kind of shit. Mm-hmm. You know? So the vet just looked at her and said, I'm trying to give you go-home instructions for a, a living creature, and you're not paying any attention. And the nanny turned around and said, well, I've got to pay attention to the kids. And that, 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 like in this whole fucking excuse why she couldn't properly listen to the vet. So it was this close to not relinquishing the dog back to the fucking nanny. Wow. <laughs> Fast forward. They all knew I was in 16 Candles. They've been my vets for the longest time. I love my vet. And mm-hmm. I'm not saying names, you know, mm-hmm. but... but like, my vet is fabulous, and all the techs there are fabulous. Mm-hmm. I had signed uh, one of my pictures that have, like, the two screenshots in one and then black area next to either of them so that if I sign it in one place, there's a blank black space for whoever to get somebody else in the picture to sign if they should happen to be in, in their sights of these people. Fine. Mm-hmm. So I autographed one to the VCA, Wilshire, whatever, staff. Yep. Next thing I know, I'm bringing in one of my parakeets for some stupid whatever and they bring me the picture, and there's a big arrow pointing to Molly Ringwald's face that says, Bad Doggy Mama. Who? Oh. <laughs> like, you know, you want to be reserved, you want to be weird, you want to be like, I don't know, it's just the whole thing is stilted, it's not real. Like, it's just there's something not right there, and I don't know what it is. Yeah. Like, the mom, the mom, Adele, was always like, like that paranoid, always like looking, like that that look, like I don't know. And then the dad, 
I don't know. I mean, here it is. I showed up on the set, and Molly's like, oh, you speak French? I speak French. Where'd you go? I was like, the Lycée Français de New York. And my grandma's French and all that. Where'd you go? The Lycée Français in Los Angeles. Fine. Okay. Then she'd start piping up about how her dad was a jazz. I'm like, yeah, my mom's a jazz composer. So her dad, Bob Ringwald, was a blind jazz pianist. Okay. So what? And my mom's a composer. Guess what? So what? Like... So it was always this little competitive thing, and I think she didn't like that every time she opened her mouth to say, I can do this, it's like, well, so can I, so what? Mm-hmm. She didn't like that. So, like, right away, right away, it's, we, we kind of hit it off weirdly from the, from the get. Like, and it was her choice to hire me, too. John left that to her. Like, the last few people that went in, she was at the last audition, so I'm sure she had some kind of influence over who got to be her best friend in the movie. I mean, the whole thing was just set up that Molly could be like a little princess. Okay. Yeah. Are we are we bored yet? Well, you I'm know, <laughs> I'm gonna go jump in the pool now with all my clothes on. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm gonna go buy cocaine from the fucking property master, and then Molly is gonna come in my room and go through my prop bag because she didn't like the way the guy they hired out of Chicago, Roger Jacobs, did her makeup. She didn't like it, so she would do it over again in my room. Right. Yeah. So she finds the little vial of cocaine that I've got in my prop bag, because of course I want to keep it on me. I'm not leaving it around anywhere. Mm -hmm. So she finds that, goes and tattles, tells everybody. Wow. Next thing you know, Mr. Eddie Henriquez, big, fussy, fussy Hollywood makeup artist, shows up on the set like the next week, like, I'm now doing Molly's makeup, and Roger's like, wait, what? So he got bumped down, because little Miss Pris, you know. Then she decided that nice pink outfit that, that she wears at the dance, that was my wardrobe. She decided that Leanne doesn't get that. I like it. I think my character should have it. So John Sales and Marla Schlamm, I can't believe I'm remembering everybody's name right now, mm-hmm. but I guess I'm supposed to be telling the story. This is why it's coming so clearly. Mm-hmm. Marla and John had to go shopping at the Old Orchard Mall to get me a jeans mini skirt and a sweater, and I had to go do this emergency last-minute fucking fitting because Molly, like... You know? Okay. Yeah. That's fine. And who's on the friendly list and who's not? Go fuck yourself, Molly. Sorry. Well, I read <laughs> one account. All these people. Yeah. I, I don't want to gossip about Molly, but I'll say Go this. Ahead. I'll, 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 I just started. Well, I'll say this. I read one account where she was at her own book signing, and I heard yeah. that she wasn't even friendly at that, and that's just an account that I read from right. some blog. Right, and then blog. she made people pay her $75,000. She doesn't do conventions. Uh, I don't think she hangs out with civilians, right? So she doesn't want to do conventions. Then she got a guarantee for like $75,000, something ridiculous, high five figures. And then, like, the people who met her just came out so unsatisfied. Mm-hmm. Because she was not nice. She's just not inclusive. She's just, she's, God only knows what that looks like in bed. <laughs> Maybe she's had three children. Sorry, Molly. Not really. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, before there was internet, like, I badmouthed her to somebody. And I remember getting a phone call. A phone call. I was in New York, and Molly calls. She's like, I hear you've been talking about me. It's like, who are you, the fucking Hollywood mafia? <laughs> Like, who cares? Like, and back then I was like, oh, shit, I'm busted. Like, but now, like, I don't care. Guess what? Yeah. If you don't want people to talk about you a certain way, then don't behave in a manner that makes people, like, if you don't like the way you act. My mom raised me this way. Mm Mm-hmm. If you don't want people to know that you're doing something, the best way to have that happen is not to do it. Yep. And if you're doing something and you can't outwardly say, I do this, I smoke pot. Leanne Curtis smokes pot. I love pot. Pot mm-hmm. is my friend. Every addict says it. I don't care. Right now, I still love pot. Fine. Mm-hmm. Who cares? Yep. This is why I got blacklisted because, like, uh, this is why, oh, she's a handful and she's, oh, she smokes pot. Ooh, ooh, oh. Go fuck yourself. I had three beautiful kids. I still smoke pot. I'll probably end up ruling the world with riding the frequency and all this other money I'm going to end up making. And you know what? 
I'm satisfied. So I really don't care what anybody else says because I feel good. Yep. Now, I've learned that it doesn't matter. As long as I feel good and I'm not out feeling good by way of, you know, mass murders and, and, and playing misery with people and cutting off people's toes one by Like, I'm not torturing anybody. Nope. You know, I've tortured myself long enough. Mm-hmm. We're done with that now. Yeah, and some of the great, uh, there's a lot of great movies out about pot smoking. Like, I love The Big Lebowski. <laughs> yep. <laughs> dude, I call my mentor dude all the time. He's like, oh, my God, you just, every time you call me dude, I think the white Russian. <laughs> the white Russian, yep. <laughs> white Russian. Like, uh, funny. Yep. So, no, you know, and I I, I like uh, Molly, as a, I liked her in 16 Candles in the John Hughes yeah. movies, you know, but... But yep. like, I don't know that it's any, like, everybody's that special. Yeah. But, like, people make a fuss, like, because it's been set up to look a certain way. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and that's okay, whatever. But see, this is just goes to show you. Whatever you focus on is what comes up. If you ever wanted to buy a certain kind of car, then that's all you see on the road. Yeah. Okay, that, there you go, right there. There's, there's, I can't say anything more. There's the evidence right there. This is how it works. What yeah. you focus on materializes well i i like doing the uh, this show and i love talking to the people in the movies and it's a delight for me when i watch 16 candles and know that i've had you on here twice and john coppola has been on here and i just you know smile when i see both of you you know because like i got to talk to two re- very real people with great personalities well, thank you. Yeah. And that's what I, I, I urge you not to change, you know. I, I'm no censor. I have no problem with your language. I, I love the fact that you're you. Keep being you. Thank you, Greg. You do the same. Yes. Seriously. Yes. There I'll only be one. Yes. I'll have to send you my email address so you can send me those uh, MP3s. Yeah, MP3, sure. Yeah, and uh, that way, you know, I can... Uh, I can, you can pop uh, them in if you want, and you can play them if you want. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, absolutely. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know what? We're f- coming down on almost a quarter to uh, uh, two hours here. <laughs> is this your longest one? No, Bruce Glover was my longest. He went three hours. Bruce. <laughs> yeah. I'll get you, my pretty. I'm sorry. Wrong movie. All right. Yep. Before I let you go, would you mind doing a plug for my show? Of course not. What do you want me to say? Yeah. Just state your name and say you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise out of New Brunswick, Canada. This is Leanne Curtis, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise out of... uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh-oh. That's actually funny. Yeah, I'll keep that in. <laughs> did you just say New Brunswick, Alberta? What did you say? New Brunswick, Canada. Canada. <laughs> right. See, I almost got to the end. There you go. Try her again. <laughs> New Brunswick, Canada. All right. This is Leah Curtis, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise out of New Brunswick, Canada. And Canada loves Leanne, and certainly I do too. Oh, yes, well, absolutely. Leanne, love you long time. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and you love Getty as well. I love Getty long time. Don't tell his lover. <laughs> lover. Lover. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know what? I'm go. I'll keep in touch with you on Facebook. I love seeing your videos, and uh, it was just fantastic to have you come on here a second time. And uh, sometime down the road, I'll have you come back on a third time. I, I can't sure, resist. There you go. We can go for strike three. <laughs> 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 yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Leanne, you have yourself a wonderful day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't you give do your the same, Greg. Don't give your mom too much of a hard time. <laughs> no, hopefully she won't give me too much of a hard time, and we'll just keep out of each other's hair. <laughs> we'll get her her chocolate milk. 
There you go. Chocolate milk and a brownie. That'll keep her quiet for just about a little while. Actually, it's almost time to give her her lunch. What is it, 1 o'clock yet? It's close to it, isn't it? It's getting there. Yep, it's right. getting there. It's almost yeah, 2 o'clock here. around one thirty, so that's good. Get there some. you go. Yep. Pop a little quick meditation in so that I can stay calm through lunch. <laughs> and then go back to reading Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, How to Lose Your Mind and Create a New One. Well, Joe Dispenza... I've already lost my mind, clearly, um, and creating part of a new one. I, there's only a little bit of my old mind that I want to drop. So, But anyway, I'll go be reading that while she's eating her food, and hopefully things will start crack-lacking visibly. <laughs> go behave yourself. Absolutely, no. absolutely. Well, Lee and Curtis, I'll let you go, and I wish you a fantastic day, and keep being creative. We know we're all expecting great things out of you, and that'll be no surprise. No pressure or anything. Yeah. <laughs> you take care, and you. Uh, God bless you. You have a wonderful day. Well, thank you. You do the same, Greg. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate the attention. My ego loves it. Thank you. <laughs> you take care. All right, you behave. Yes, absolutely. Be well. Yep, you too. Okay, bye.